Facebook groups met weekly for six sessions. It just popped up on my screen, sorry. Um, and the online group was purely a support group with no MBSR techniques taught. Everyone could just see each other on their computer screen and, and talk throughout the meeting. So we collected both quantitative and qualitative data um, to look at the impact of both of these interventions. And both of these studies showed that um, adolescents with chronic illness are open to mind, body, and psychoeducational interventions, such as meditation, yoga, and group support. Oops, sorry. I am not able to advance my slide for some reason. Oh, let's try that. Hmm. Uh oh. Any ideas? No. Um, let's see. Why am I not all of a sudden? <laughs> try, try stop sharing and then share again. I can't find my mouse. Oh, there you go. Oh, there it was. Phew. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. So in this study, both groups demonstrated significant decreases in illness-related stress and improved coping skills. There was a significant decrease in total illness-related stress in the overall group, as well as in each of the intervention groups. Coping skills significantly improved in the video group and approach significance in the overall group. Higher baseline anxiety and depression scores were associated with greater improvement in both total stress and anxiety and depression scores post the intervention in both groups. So increased baseline distress significantly predicted more improvement. Um, though overall anxiety and depression didn't significantly change in either group. So these findings are similar to other studies which show that these types of interventions often have greater impact on those who have higher levels of distress. And this knowledge can help us as clinicians identify which of our patients might derive benefit from these type of interventions. So the qualitative data showed that both groups frequently reported the social support that they felt by group participation and the overall benefit to being with and talking with others who have similar life experiences. The MBSR group um, express benefits of learning specific techniques, strategies, and skills that they could then apply in real life situations when they were feeling anxious or stressed um, and able to get better control over their situation, such as when they were having palpitations or feeling anxious. The video or Skype or Zoom format, the group uh, online format is useful for teens who are unable to meet in person or who don't want to meet in person due to time or distance constraints, but who could benefit from the group support. Some of the participants in this group lived in other states and they were still able to participate. So the findings of this study showed us that both of these group formats are effective methods of group support and that the MBSR group had the added benefit of learning and adopting these mind-body techniques and thought processes, which could help them reduce stress and improve their coping. So we just finished um, data collection of our third adolescent group. We did a study um, with 16 adolescents. Uh, we had eight in the control and eight in the active group uh, where the, they had this six session MBSR uh, program, but also we measured their IL-6, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine pre and post. So we're bringing in a, we brought in a physiological parameter to this third study to see if there's any physiological uh, measurement that we might be able to correlate anxiety or, or effect of the intervention. So that is in the analysis phase right now. One second. So as I said earlier, one of the beauties of the MBSR program is that different components can be used to tailor um, and tailor to various populations both healthy and clinical, adults and kids. So with the positive outcomes we had with our two adolescent patient studies, um, Dr. Martin, who, who was on our panel today, um, had the idea to develop and to try to develop and implement a program that we could bring to our clinical staff in the Heart Institute to increase mindfulness, uh, to bring to our, ourselves and to our patients. And he, 
generously provided the funding, offered to, prov to provide the funding for this program through his endowed chair. So we completed the first cohort of mindful mentors who were um, 35 RNs, MDs, social workers, child life specialists, techs, mostly from cardiology, some from outside of cardiology. And then we just completed our second cohort that were 60 clinicians and non-clinicians from all around the hospital. So this program, um, our, our vision for this program was that it's, it was a 12 month program uh, with a train the trainer approach that started with 16 hours of initial intensive training over two eight hour days spread a month apart um, where we taught the tools needed to begin or to continue a personal mindfulness practice such as various types of meditations as well as discussing important topics um, such as emotional boundaries, self-compassion, difficult emotions, nonviolent communication, misconceptions, and overcoming barriers to practice moving forward. So the goal was that the mindful mentors would then teach other staff members what they learned, and then they could all bring those techniques to patients as they became more comfortable. So we also met for an hour in the 12 month program, we met for an hour each month to debrief, to talk about what's working, what's not working, to share ideas of, of things that we can move forward. And then at the end of the program, each mindful mentor is asked to develop an individual project or a group project um, that they could bring to their unit, to their uh, office mates, to their coworkers um, that was related to some mindfulness project that they could use for themselves or to bring to their coworkers or, the, or, or to their patients. Um, and it was left wide open as to what, what the project could be. And you'll hear from some of our panelists today, some of the amazing projects that have been done um, and that are ongoing. So the outcomes from our first pilot cohort were very positive compared with pre-training scores. There were significant improvements three to 12 months at, after the initial training in stress and distress, in anxiety, in self-efficacy and helping patients using non-drug therapies, in mindfulness, in confidence in providing calm, compassionate care, and in burnout. So finally, um, our current projects are the, the at third adolescent study that I just uh, mentioned, and our med meditation program for pregnant moms who have, have a fetal CHD or congenital heart disease diagnosis. Um, and Dr. D'Onofrio is, is going to talk more about that. This is her idea that she brought several of us in to work on this project. And we just found out today that it's approved by the IRB. So we will anxiously get started working on this, on our weekly meditation program um, for the pregnant moms. So let me stop sharing. How do I do that? Oop. Oh my goodness. Okay. And so I would like to welcome Dr. Mary D'Onofrio, um, who is going to talk about this fetal program that, we've, that we're starting and also a couple of questions um, for you, Dr. D'Onofrio. How did you think about using this patient, this program for your patient population? And what outcomes do you think would be most meaningful for your population? And what variables would you like to look at? And anything else that you would like to discuss? <laughs> Thanks, Vicki. Um, that was a great presentation. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here uh, and excited to get going on this amazing project that Vicki and I have been working on um, and at least thinking about for the last couple of years. Um, I've been doing fetal cardiology now since uh, 1995. Um, and there is one absolute fact is that uh, women who come in uh, to see us um, are terrified right from the start. And actually, even if the fetal heart ends up being normal, just the anxiety of walking in and perhaps hearing that something's wrong with your unborn child is overwhelming. Um, but certainly once there's a diagnosis of congenital heart disease, um, it becomes that much more challenging. So um, I've known it's, it's been an um, important issue for the women that I take care of. 
Um, but the science that has started to develop over the last 10 years um, really show that it's more than just a mom who's upset and you give her some tissues and you send her on her way, that basically there are longstanding effects of stress and anxiety um, uh, on a mom, uh, on a dad, uh, on uh, relating to their marriage, relating to even how they deal with their child after delivery. And more recently, um, um, as we sort of look more into the fetal brain and fetal brain development, which is something that we do here um, uh, through the work of Kathy Limperopoulos uh, and the fetal brain group, um, what we're learning is that maternal stress and anxiety has true physical effects on the unborn child, including it affects the way the brain grows and develops in utero which then has long-term um, potential outcome for our children that survive congenital heart disease and may even affect how they form their own relationships and do in school and how they sort of, uh, what happens to them as grownups. So it truly is the mantra that we have in, fe in the fetal world is that everything about us starts um, from before we're born. And so what can we do to help um, and so coming with that perspective, um, we're, we constantly are trying to figure out how to um, relieve the stress and anxiety in these pregnant women. And so I kind of watched Vicki from afar um, sort of work on the adolescent patients and on our staff and how everybody just loved our Friday meditation sessions um, with Vicki um, and really started to think maybe we could use this um, with the pregnant ladies. Um, Vic, I asked Vicki to lecture um, an uh, international group of nurse coordinators um, who do fetal cardiology a couple years ago, and it was overwhelming how much everyone was just in desperate need of a way to help these pregnant women. Um, and so that really is what started it all. Um, what we're looking for, first off, is to improve maternal well-being. Um, absolutely. I think it helps during pregnancy, um, and hopefully it carries over into how these moms and dads then bond with their child in the unit and afterwards, and I think Emily will talk about that. The longer-term goals would be, if we're right um, and can minimize stress in the pregnant woman, it'll make um, outcomes for the kids better such that ultimately our hope is that um, the kids will end up doing better in school um, because their brain develops normally. So it's interesting how deep this all goes. Um, the work that we're doing um, that Vicki mentioned is we're going to sort of institute these um, programs in the pregnant lady and look at markers of stress and anxiety um, before and after the program and then hopefully track it um, even uh, post delivery um, for the moms to see if they can hold on to these coping skills. And if our pilot works at Children's National, we're gonna take it on the road um, and make it available nationally to study this um, through the Fetal Heart Society. So actually an international group of nurse coordinators. So I'm hoping um, that's our future. Um, to try it local and then take it on the road. Uh, and it's thanks to Vicki and Emily and certainly all the amazing people at Children's. Thank you so much, Dr. Denarfi. <laughs> thanks to you also. Um, you have such a big voice with this population. And so we really appreciate you and your support and your ideas and your perspectives. And I know you have to run thanks, off Vicky. to another meeting. Thank you so much. Um, yes. Yeah, you're welcome. And if anybody has any questions for me, certainly uh, Emily and Vicki can answer them better than me <laughs> with regards to how we're going to institute it. I rely on their expertise, um, just um, uh, begging on behalf of our patients uh, for something to help them. So thank you all. And I apologize that I have to run. Thank you. And Emily will be on in a few minutes to talk about to talk more about her program with this as well. But next up is Dr. Gerard Martin, who was instrumental in us forming our, the Mindful Mentors Program. Um, it was his idea. One day he came into my office and said, 
what can we do to help the, the stress levels of our patients? And that conversation became what was eventually the Mindful Mentors Program. And with his generous support, we've been able to make that happen for two, for almost a hundred um, staff it, up to now. So Dr. Martin, are you, I see your name. Can you? Hello. There he Hi. is. Hi. So if you can tell us what it was about stress reduction, mindfulness that made you think about bringing a program like this to our institution and what ideas, in addition to everything else you wanna talk about, um, what ideas do you have about bringing, incorporating this into physician visits, um, outpatient visits? All right, so first of all, uh, it's all about you, Vicki, you taught me. Um, and I, I remember, um, well, first of all, maybe that the old adage really isn't true. You know, the adage, you, uh, can't, teach, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, uh, I'm an old dog and I learned a new trick. So uh, thank you to uh, Vicki for teaching me a, a new trick. You know, I, I kind of grew up in the days of, uh, the, I think probably the family lesson that I got at home always was just get over it. And I mean, I think probably all of us at some point in our life just heard that term, just get over it. And with congenital heart disease in our patients, um, it wasn't that we were telling people to get up, just get over it, but we just assumed that stress was there and there was nothing we could do about it. You know, our focus early on, you know, third, I've been at Children's for 35 years. And so I, I trained in the dark ages or, or just as we were coming and maybe the middle ages, as we were coming out of the middle ages before the current era. And we were just focused on survival and we would see these parents come in and, and the fear that they would have and the stress and the angst that they would have. And we would just say, yeah, well, of course you've got a kid with heart disease. And, but we're going to keep them alive. Don't worry, just get over it. And I think as our survivals got better, I started, you know, and then we started thinking about other outcomes. You know, how are they doing in school? How are they doing in life in general? The one thing that struck me was the rate of mental health concerns in our patients. Uh, we now know that adults with congenital heart disease, and, and probably this is adolescents as well, about 30 to 35% of them have mental health issues. They have depression, they have anxiety, and not just a little anxiety. These kids are just a little depression. They're now already being medicated. I mean, they are on some really significant medications for their anxiety or depression. So between the work that I heard Vicki was doing with the heart rhythm patients at Children's and her groups, and then one Grand Rounds presentation at Children's, that was when it was with cancer patients. There was a visiting professor from uh, Boston Children's that came and talked about their program with mindfulness at Boston. And that's when I left Grand Rounds and went up to Vicki's office and said, Vicki, we need to do something for all our patients, just not rhythm patients. So um, it's been uh, amazing. Vicki told me to settle down. We, we, we need to figure out how to approach this. I wanted to go right out to the patients and Vicki said, um, maybe it's awareness, maybe it's figuring out what's going on with our staff so that they're in a better place to address it or identify it in the patients. And that was the, the first two cohorts. And that, that surely was uh, a tremendous finding that you know, we could get our staff aware that our staff could uh, start doing things differently with the families. So I think the second part of Vicki's question was what next? That's how I got here with this. Uh, the what next after seeing what's been going on is how do we how do we make this more widely available right now 
it it's not i i shouldn't say this because someone might argue with me but i don't think it's something that is immediately available to all our families we we may catch certain families that either raise their hands and say that they're really struggling or we may identify a family that's particularly vulnerable and then we reach out to them to see yes they are struggling but i think my guess is everybody could benefit from this um, and and certainly you know i can't you know you can add on top of it a covid pandemic and you know you just the the amount of stress and anxiety in our world is palpable um so i i think you know i and answer your questions you know i don't know i i wonder if you know just adding a question to all of our intake uh, that the nurses do with the families. Um, as a doctor, I certainly am saying to families, hey, you know, by the way, one of the things I see later on in life is the impact that this has on children. And we see stress and anxiety and these types of issues later on. I just want you to be aware of it. And that's when the family comes back to me and says, Oh no, we're aware of it. We 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 see that already, and and so I I think you know personally I'm I'm making it part of my talk with families. I think our nurses could do that. Um, you know I, I now see all of our patients when they come in when they leave. Our nurses give them a little card when they leave that says you know your height, your weight, your diagnosis, your next appointment. Maybe there could be something on the bottom of that said, oh, by the way, if you know, if you are feeling stressed, we have a program that you might benefit from. And so I, I just think there's lots of ways to get this out there to all of the families. But I think as individual practitioners, we're all called to, you know, just uh, take it on ourselves until we have a systematic approach. But thank you, Vicki, you've been tremendous. Thank you. Well, that wouldn't have happened without you. Thank you. And thank you for those words of wisdom and those great ideas. And there are, are simple things that we can do that can have a big impact. Thank you for sharing. We've got a couple of uh, nurses. We've got a few nurses on our panel as well that are gonna jump in with, with more ideas in that direction as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for all your support and everything that you are doing to keep this going. Next up is Emily Stein, who is our social worker in the CICU. Um, Emily is going to talk about how she has brought forward her work in this area to the inpatient population um, and, and, and ideas moving forward. So welcome, Emily. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Vicki. Uh, yeah, I mean, so far, ever, I agree with everything everybody has been saying is that this is a very important area and there's lots of work that can be done. Some of it big, some of it small. So one of the things that we've really been looking at um, in the CICU is sort of starting from the beginning in terms of we all understand that our parents are stressed and anxious and experiencing emotional distress. But up until recently, um, there hasn't been a lot of true assessment of families at bedside. And so something that my colleagues and I, um, along with just a major push at the hospital, has been really working in standardized assessments of mental health for parents. And so in the CICU over the past year, starting in back in January, we began assessing all of our English speaking mothers with the plans to roll these things out for postpartum depression. Um, to get a better understanding uh, where they were at from a depression standpoint. And additionally, because of what we're seeing in regards to the neurodevelopmental outcomes over time, we also really wanted to understand about anxiety as well. And so uh, in the CICU, we've also, in addition to doing the postpartum screening, have been assessing parents for anxiety. A lot of the research that is out there currently in the literature is typically about NICUs. And so I think originally when we started doing this, we thought that our results would be similar. Um, but actually what we are finding is that our parents, when they're reporting emotional disturbances, it's anxiety. And so that really got us thinking about how we could better support our parents knowing 
this very special subset. We have a families in the ICU dealing with traumatic stress that does not go away for long periods of time that really creates stressful interactions and sort of changes the way our parents are able to think and cope and interact with others at bedside. Um, and so one of the things that I have been working on with um, Melissa Jones and Cheryl Caparola through the Cardiac Care Neurodevelopmental Program is creating a program and we have a research study called um, BEST or Bedside Engagement Support Tools looking at this very multifaceted problem of how do we help families cope knowing that there's a lot of stress and knowing that there's all these neurodevelopmental outcomes that are affected by stress and um, emotional disturbances. And so what we have come up with is an intervention that's a two-phase intervention. We are currently right now doing a variety of different assessments to get a baseline. And then eventually we'll go into our intervention phase, which involves um, two educational sessions. The first session will be about teaching mindful presence to parents at bedside. So one of the things that we know about anxiety is that when you are experiencing preoccupation with fearful thoughts, it's very difficult for you to notice what's going on in front of you. And something that we see time and time again is parents reporting low rates of maternal and paternal satisfaction in terms of their role as a parent at bedside. And that, uh, that sort of plays into per, uh, parental distress. So we're hopeful that teaching mindfulness, helping them manage their, their anxious thoughts that are created by the environment that they're in and exacerbated by that environment, and also teaching them mindful presence and mindful interaction with their babies can help potentially offset some of that traumatic stress and some of those negative thought patterns that we sort of learn during these hard times. You know, one of the things that we often forget is we can go into one environment being one person and then an environment can change us. It can teach us unhelpful coping strategies. It can teach us certain thoughts. And the more we practice those thoughts, if they're unhealthy, the sort of the, the difference in the way we will kind of cope going forward. And so it's our hope that we can take these families in this very fragile state and teach them how to work with those unhealthy thoughts using mindfulness techniques and potentially teach them what to do with them so that they're not spending you know, hours ruminating in, in these very anxious places, but we're teaching them consistently to come back to bedside and come back to presence. So that's sort of how we're using mindfulness um, for this intervention for this, this BEST study that we're hopeful that we'll start to do um, this coming spring. Additionally, we are trying really to change the culture of mindfulness in the CICU. And one of the ways that um, we're doing that is so we were recently able to get iPads for every room. And so on all these iPads are different meditation and mindfulness apps, as well as yoga apps that parents, staff, families, patients can use at any time. And it's our hope that really just having some resources in the room, if someone's feeling overwhelmed, a nurse could just direct them to, hey, did you know that there's, there's stuff here? And potentially that could help, you know, give them a, a parent or a staff member or anybody really just a moment of relaxation. Or if a family member is noticing like, hey, I'm really anxious right now. Let me do a quick five minute breathing thing and come back to presence. So you know, we're working on assessing our parents, really understanding where they're at now. And we're hopeful that some of these new mindfulness techniques will potentially help us learn how we can change some of the outcomes that I think Dr. Martin mentioned that he's seeing down the line. So that's what we're doing now. Thank you. Amazing, amazing, amazing work you're doing there. And it's so much fun working with you on all these projects. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, next up, so the next, our next four participants are, have all been through the Mindful Mentors program and they're doing amazing things on their, on their units. Um, Sarah Gallagher is the interim clinical manager on heart and kidney unit and also a, pro, a program specialist. Um, Sarah, can you come on and talk about what you've done so far on heart and kidney unit and your wishes for future projects? Um, so I was in the cohort, the first cohort that we grew um, with the Mindful Mentors. And one thing, just coming from the heart and kidney unit and the population we serve, um, it can be very stressful. And my thoughts immediately went to these 21-year-old nurses who were fresh out of nursing school, 
who come in and hit the ground running and we never give them a second to focus on that. We expect them to give and give, but how can you give from an empty? How, if you're not taking care of yourself, how can you pass those coping skills and, um, you know, even lifelong skills onto your patients and their families? So, um, Camille Barker, um, the previous um, clinical educator, and I went through the cohort together. And our first thought was we need to get this into a, for our nurses. We need them to have these coping skills and have these just little techniques, even if it's a couple deep breaths before they walk into a patient room to reset. Um, making sure that they have those skills on a daily basis. So we incorporated it into our orientation program. We wanted to start with the new grads coming in and our grand plans were we would then go from them and then train our preceptors. So they were speaking the same language. Um, our preceptors could then evaluate, you know, are they seeing stress and are they using any of those skills? And they can just um, be that trigger for that new grad that they then reset themselves and you know then go about their day. So we did incorporate that in every time they had a um, education on the unit, there would be a mindfulness practice of different techniques. Unfortunately, COVID occurred. Um, so our or education and everything looked a little bit different and we didn't even have a handle on what that looked like. So it disrupted it a bit. Um, so we were never able to come to that back end of them coming off of orientation to really evaluate it. So our goal right now is for the spring cohort to have a full year long mindfulness training um, and a little more in depth on the unit because now more than ever is when we think that they need it. So we need to just make it a priority and make it happen for them. Um, in regards to evaluating how we wanted to do that. Um, Vicki was very supportive with us of getting Fitbits for our um, new grads. We weren't able to implement it um, due to COVID, but we, our idea is that we give them the coping mechanisms, we train them, and then put them in a simulation environment. We have very high tech simulation equipment that was um, purchased through a grant for the unit. So we can replicate our extremely sick patients to the detail. And so we want to put them in those simulation environment with the Fitbit to see using these quick mindfulness techniques, can they ha actually have a physical change on their body in this stressful situation um, to really evaluate, you know, are we using the correct techniques or which techniques have the most bang for your buck in those split second, um, you know, scenarios to where we can really focus on those because our nurse may not have a 20 minute you know session to zone out and kind of you know regroup but how you know how many do they need to kind of reset their mind and body in that environment so that is our plan of where we want to take this um and like i said focus at that new grad but eventually have training for our whole unit so that every nurse we're all under the same stresses um, day in and day out so that all of them have the techniques to then hopefully not hit that burnout and not hit those, you know, days when you're dreading to come to work or just can't wait till that clock hits and you can go home so that they can really, you know, get through so that we can then pass that on to our parents who are even more stressed at the bedside um, so they can really pass that information and that education along to them. Um, hopefully we'll have another cohort because as we've had a lot of transition on HPU, I would love to see a lot of our, you know, high hopes, our whole education team trained and mindful mentors so that they could disseminate that and we have a little more support um, from a training perspective. Um, so that was one of our grand, you know, plans and where we see this next year taking us um, with mindfulness. Um, and a lot of our nurses who are mindful mentors are now trained in drumming. Um, and so we want to see how we can bring drumming to our patients pre-procedure or even in those moments where, um, you know, we have a lot of patients who need to stay calm. You know, crying definitely is, you know, has some physiological effects on them. So can we incorporate this at that bedside to use less, you know, medications and really train our staff to utilize that at the bedside? is another goal. Um, Lisa Ring, um, 
one of our new practitioners is also trained in it as well as a lot of our tip coordinators. So our hopes this year is to see where does that fit in with the unit um, and hopefully get that going so that our staff can utilize those resources as well. Thank you, Sarah. You are changing the culture on that unit. You and the, your passion for all this has, it's really spreading on that unit and it's very evident. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, next up is Kelly Vanderwen, another, or an outpatient cardiology nurse. Hi. I'm muted. Was I muted that whole time? Yeah. Uh oh, I am so sorry. This is Kelly Vanderwen, who is an outpatient, car spectacular cardiology nurse in our outpatient clinic, who brings a lot of passion um, for for the for mindfulness to the outpatient world, and she's going to talk about what she's done so far and yeah. what her ideas are for the future. Yeah, so I want to talk about um, several of the nurses and some of our patient care techs as well have gone through um, the mindfulness program. So I want to talk about some of the programs that we've either implemented, are working on, some challenges we've run into along the way, and just kind of what our plans are for the for the future, hopefully, with this mindfulness program. So. Um, one of our nurses is currently working on, um, for her mindfulness project, one of our challenges that we have in the outpatient world is that we're a lot faster paced as far as patient care goes um, compared to the inpatient side. So we really don't have that time to always be able to sit down at the bedside with the patient and their families like we would on the inpatient side to go over some of these techniques and these um, just like programs that might be available whatnot so one of the nurses is working on a project where she's going to create like the little um the little badge chiclets that we have um that'll just have some some quick simple mindfulness techniques um that both like the staff members will have available for themselves they'll easily be able to hand it out to the family even if it's just as simple as them making a quick photocopy of their badge chiclet kind of thing and being like oh here's some Reese's resources for you. Um, but just something that's quick at hand and kind of there when you need it kind of thing. Um, so that's one of our projects that is in the works. And um, another project that that Vicki and I kind of took took a lead on, but it's kind of been put on hold a little bit because of COVID. So so I, I love all things like musical instruments and, and I love to play music and I love to get patients involved with music. So we got some musical instruments, you know, little like um, tambourines and triangles and like um, little egg shakers and whatnot. And the thought was some of these patients, especially our younger population, um, they're sitting in the waiting room, they're nervous, they're freaked out. The last thing they wanna do is to be in a doctor's office. So we thought, what if we make it a fun place? What if we kind of almost turn it into like a dance party kind of thing? So, so we got this like bag of instruments and um, Unfortunately, it's on hold at the moment because we can't have our big groups, but we did have a time or two where we had like basically a, like a Congo line of patients and we're going around the clinic and we've got our instruments and I'll never forget there was this one guy and he was he was one of our patients and he was probably like a, a young teenage, um, a little bit developmentally delayed and just out of nowhere, he comes out and he takes the tambourine from one of our nurse practitioners and he just took the lead on our Congo line. And, and here's this guy who was just quiet and reserved and just here for his appointment and just came out of his shell and his mom's like videotaping us because like she saw this side of him that she had never seen before. So um, we, ho we hope to be able to, to pick that up when we can because it just kind of takes the edge off and they're like, wow, like this is kind of a fun place to be. So, so that's on hold at the moment, but we're going to work on that some more. So.
And then um, another project that one of our nurses is working on. So this one's still in the works as well. But we have a nurse that works closely alongside with our POTS patients. And she is going to have a plan to come up with some like some hands on um, distractors for our POTS patients. She's going to put some resources together for them because those who have worked with the population know they have a, they have a lot of anxiety. They, they're just, um, there's a lot going on. So she's hoping by creating these distractive like hands on techniques, it'll kind of take away some of, um, some of those symptoms that they may experience sometimes. Um, some projects that we've had like kind of at the back of our minds, but we haven't really started yet is um, for like our pre-op patients when they come in for their pre-op appointment. So these are parents that are about to prepare for their child to not only have open heart surgery, but then a uh, hospital stay as well. So the thought is when they come for their pre-op appointment, that's the perfect time to start teaching some of these mindfulness techniques so that when they're in the hospital, they're stressed, you know, day of surgery, they're sitting there waiting for um, updates from the surgeon and whatnot. They've got in the back of their mind a couple of techniques to um, kind of reduce their stress a little bit. So we haven't really put that into play yet, but it's kind of on the back burner, as well as like for our transplant patients as well. Um, these are patients that we see quite often. They, and some of them are just kind of over this place. They, the last thing they want, especially once again, for some of our younger ones is to go to the lab, to get lab draws and whatnot. And a lot of times this kind of just puts them over the edge. So if there's some way that we can kind of come up with some some ideas to, you know, teach them that, you know, it's not so scary or just kind of relax when they're in the lab or even some of our patients um, that when they're here in the clinic, they have to get a flu shot. The last thing they want is to, you know, have to get poked. So um, we had a teenager recently that needed a flu shot. I think she was like 14 or 15 and it just sent her over the edge. And so we tried for, Vicki and I tried for quite some time to just come up with some techniques to calm her to, to get that flu sh shot done. So I think that's definitely another population that we need to work on to just kind of come up with, with some ideas to relieve their anxiety because the hospital is the last place they want to be, but unfortunately they have to come here often. So. Um, lastly, we do some, we try and do some mindfulness with the staffs every now and then. Vicki will lead that. We used to do it more often, but COVID makes it so we can't do it quite as often as we'd like. But we've had some small groups here and there on like a Friday morning where we'll gather and just do some stretches, some mindfulness, some breathing. And um, it just kind of puts us in a great place to start the day. So, so that's kind of what we have going on in the outpatient world here in cardiology. Wow. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All, the, all that enthusiasm. That's how Kelly is all the time. So you can yeah. see all the energy she brings to this, to our clinic. Thank, thank you. you. Um, we have two more panelists. I know we're running short on time. Um, hopefully everybody can stay for a few extra minutes because um, um, we've got some, some things I really want you to hear about. Um, next up is Lisa Ring. And Lisa is going to talk about how she's incorporated mindfulness into her practice. Um, and, and also she runs the advanced practice provider group um, and what she has, what she is doing with that group. Thank, Thank you, you, Kelly. I don't know, Kelly, I, I'm not sure I have quite your enthusiasm. but <laughs> Thank you, everyone. This has just been fa so fantastic hearing all the work that everyone is doing and um, especially under Vicki's leadership. It's just, uh, I'm so happy to be part of this. Um, I guess I first started out with uh, tentatively going to some of Vicki's mindful um, uh, sessions on the HKU. And I really um, realized as a provider, just how important it is for us as, as um, staff and our stress to make sure that we're not <clears throat> having um, so much stress when we're working with our families that are also under so much stress. So this really led me to um, join the Mindful Mentors cohort, which I learned so much more through that as well to help with my practice and um, helping families and, and staff both. Um, one of my biggest passions is um, for our procedures that we do that are painful, that children are awake for. It's just so important that we are able to provide some mindfulness and distraction for not only the families 
uh, or for the patients, but for the parents and for the staff so that the environment is calm and that we're able to um, be more successful and, and improve um, improve how children are able to get through these, these procedures. And to your point of starting in the clinic and continuing through the CICU and then through the HKU, what a great continuum to, to really be able to be helpful for our families. Um, and secondly, I am, have been a nurse, nurse practitioner for a long, long time and old school, as Dr. Martin was kind of talking about through all of our my experiences working in the ER and the PICU and other areas are, we were never really taught how to provide any self-care for ourselves in order to be more helpful to our families because our families were the priority um, in dealing with the stress that they were going under. So as the uh, advanced practice provider education lead, I've really felt it was important to in incorporate um, mindfulness into our orientation for all of the advanced practice providers coming into the organization, whether they are a new nurse practitioner or um, someone who is um, transferring from one position to another, we offer, um, we, I actually do a mindfulness session um, at the end of our didactic content for the orientation, as well as um, in providing resources for um, those that are, are, in, are new into the role, all the resources for, that are available for um, provider wellness, wellness, including the Mindful Mentors Program and Improving, including um, the meditation workshops that are offered, including all the information that that is available also on the internet, because we all know we can get really, really busy and maybe we don't think we have time to just take that one minute to take a deep breath to settle down before we go on to the next thing. And um, I just want to set that tone that this is an organization that we are um, a team of, of people that realize that that's important to not only care for ourselves, but for our families as well. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for all your great work. Um, and, and it's incredible what your, how far your reach is as well. Um, finally, I, I intentionally put Clarissa Chan Salcedo on, as the last speaker of our panel, uh, because she is our nurse informatics expert and she really wants to find ways to help us all document all of these great things, all of these mindfulness techniques, all, all of these um, actions that everybody's doing to be able to document it in Cerner and find ways that we can all share this information, that we can use this information to look at patient outcomes, um, so Clarissa, if you can come on and talk yeah. about your ideas for bringing this to Cerner in a ways that we can all document. <laughs> okay, I'll try. Thank you, Vicki. I just wanted to first thank you for the opportunity for being in the panel. Thank you for like listening to everyone. And Kelly, you gave me energy and a smile on my face today. Um, and I just wanted to you know, like, like, let you know that how I started there here, like when I heard you on the grand rounds, I said, oh, I wanted to do that. And then when you um, emailed about the mindfulness cohort, I, I'm like, yes. And I went immediately to my boss and said, can I do that? Even though I'm in informatics, I'm not really in patient care and in technology. And she said, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So I'm like ecstatic that I joined the mindfulness cohort. Um, so as far as technology, like what I um, the documentation, I, 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 although some people may disagree because technology is not always um, working right sometimes, but we cannot uh, deny that technology is part of our clinical practice. And just like uh, we document our medical interventions, we also need to document our mindfulness practice and interventions. And it is very important to document it because when you document it, there's um, uh, you can, uh, we get data and then report from it. Um, so my, my vision is that I wanted to um, uh, do a quality improvement project with, with um, the clinical staff. Um, can you hear me? Well, okay. So uh, do a quality improvement project with the staff to increase the um, mindfulness intervention on the, um, on the inpatient and the um, 
or ED um, side that, uh, that by documenting um, on Cerner. Because right now when we document, it's sometimes like a free text field. Um, everybody's documenting in their own places and uh, can't, can't really find things if we want to do that. So my goal is that we standardize our documentation in, in our documentation system so that all the data that we document is standardized and it's shareable. So what the provider or a social work or a music therapy or a nurse documents, we can easily find them and we can share information. So that's my goal. And that with that, with standardizing your documentation, we'll be able to, um, uh, report on it and share data. Um, and, and, and also with technology, because of the technology, you can also integrate reminders or prompts so that, um, for example, like working with Lisa on the non-sedated pain project and also um, my comfort measures and things like that, you can make prompts so that if you want also a certain group of population to have mindfulness practice or interventions, you can uh, create rules so that they automatically get those things. And of course, we need to have a process in place and education and always um, we need to back, we need to get this done with also with policies and guidelines. Um, so in my experience, you know, like when we wanted to increase um, process or incorporate into our workflow, um, I think like technology has helped, but most importantly, education and the process and the policies and guidelines have to be put in place. Um, also, we have other technologies out there, not just Cerner. Um, we have Get Well Network system that can be used as well and can be leveraged for that. And also, um, someone also talked about um, in the CICU using the iPads um, as a technology. And we also have the virtual um, inpatient consults that are on iPads right now. So. Um, so it's it, there's more iPads that are being deployed into the unit um, that's coming, but that's that's something that, for example, a patient is on isolation and you are not able to provide mindfulness intervention to them, then um, we're using virtual consult. Why not? We can also use um, virtual mindfulness intervention with them. So you can have you can use the iPad. The patient can be there while um, the person could be on the other the room doing guided imagery or uh, music therapy, for example. Um, it can be also incorporated in order sets, for example. So there's a lot of things that we could do and we can increase this with, um, uh, and, and I'm here to help support. Um, so if there's anything that we can increase your, um, uh, your whatever um, project and things that you have ideas on, um, Carol and I, we can um, help with the technology piece, documentation. Wow, thank you so much, Clarissa. I have a feeling your emails and your phone is gonna be very busy in the near future oh. uh, with people wanting your expertise in, in how, to do, how to do all this and, and bring the technology to help all of us bring this to everybody, our patients. I don't mind that. Lawrence is putting together a committee of people who are interested in working on this as well. So thank you so much. Um, incredible work. Um, thank you all for staying on. I um, would welcome people to stay on longer if you can for a few more minutes just to talk about if anybody has any ideas, any questions for any of the panelists, um, any, any thoughts about what's happening on your units or clinical areas or non-clinical areas, please feel free to jump in. Um, give us thoughts, ideas, feedback, perspectives. Just jump on in. Hey, this is Rachel from um, CPRU. Hi, Rachel. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to share that I've been able to use some of the um, skills that we've learned through Mindful Mentors for our CAF patients. They've had to lay down for extended periods of time, and a lot of kids at certain ages just can't tolerate um, not moving <laughs> for a long time. Um, so it's been helpful in helping them um, just make sure prolong their, their um, bed rest. Um, I had a like a preteen young boy who was very anxious and I kind of walked him through some guided meditation. I helped him 
uh, I told, asked him where he would rather be. He said his bedroom and he, I asked him to describe it and what was on his walls and that, that was really helpful. So it's been helpful for us down in CPRU as well. Thank you for sharing that. Welcome. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments? Yes, it doesn't have to be anything complicated. It can be the simplest things, just helping somebody breathe, um, bringing their attention to something different. Um, there's so many ways to bring this to your patients. Thank you for sharing that, Rochelle. Vicki, I could add something. This is Eileen, because I know that time is of the essence here. We can also add something to the evaluation for topics they would have liked to have just had an opportunity to discuss. Good idea. I'll just, this is Michelle. I'll just add one comment. We've talked about this before, Vicki. Your work is just so inspirational, as many have said, and I would totally endorse that. Um, but something that I'm wondering now that you're looking at some metabolic indicators, inflammatory cytokines in any of it, is if you've considered looking at indicators of insulin regulation, um, since insulin regulation is so tied into cortisol metabolism. And, um, and then that sort of interfaces with the role of nutrition, because nutrition is a big factor in insulin regulation. And I didn't know if any of the many small trials that have been building off of the solid foundation you've built in this area are going to add that variable. Because it's only a hypothesis, but I've always wondered, based on still limited data, how much nutrition uh, prepares the mind to be resilient, to be mindful, um, just the substrate, if you will. It's sort of an interesting variable that I really like to consider. What a great idea. Yes, that's a great idea. Uh, and you, that's your area of expertise. So, so it's, it's what a great idea for a project. Nutrition has to, you, it has to have something to, it has to, it affects well, us in so many ways, right? It's a complicated, because it's such a diffuse variable when it's outpatient nutrition, but it's, but if there's any way to capture it, I do, I do think it has to have a role. Great and idea. The first thing that goes, you know, people get stressed. The last thing they're thinking about is eating healthfully. Right. Great idea. Let's get to work on it. We'll think about it. We can think. <laughs> it. We can Love that idea. Yeah. The more physiological parameters we can bring in, also the more credibility. You know, we people who are into this, we know that it works, but we have to show the the, the doubters. Statistics how it so, works and why it works. And, and it just brings more credibility to the field, so. Well, it's interesting. And, and, and what I find is I, I occasionally run across some of your patients from the obesity group uh, and talk about the stress. Uh, and, and oftentimes they're also the, there's also an, an element of, um, they, they don't have the resources to actually even eat right. So you bring in poverty, you bring in stress, and then you bring in their health. And it's a perfect storm for causing, I mean, I just feel so inadequate in the office sitting there going, well, have anyone thought about eating better? You know, and they look at you like, uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, right. I, I hear you. I hear you. And I tell you, know, I have this simple thing about eating on the outside of, you know, only shop on the outside of the food market, you know, the first and the last aisle where none of the processed food is. But these are people that maybe don't even have a good supermarket in their neighborhood and they can't afford that. So they live off of fast food or they live off of soda or they live off of popcorn. And mm -hmm. anyway, I. No, that's exactly right. That's that's. Not the first thing on their minds, and yet that is what nourishes their mind. And it's it's just a tragic catch twenty two in terms of trying to prepare people to be mindful who cannot nourish themselves. I, I, and it's a hypothesis. We it really has not been sifted out because it's such a tiger by the tail. The whole dietary conundrum. 
largely too, because of the barriers. It's, it's too practical to be solved. <laughs> Not too practical to be solved, but too practical to have, too complicated to have been studied yet, I guess. Um, Anyway, idea. We'll brainstorm, Vicky. Yes, absolutely. I'm thinking about the the video groups of we can get a bunch of people on, you know, even in COVID land, get a bunch of people together on screen, mm -hmm. together to maybe start working on this, educating them and teaching them techniques. And I don't know. The possibilities are endless. Thank you. What a great idea. Anybody else have any I ideas to share? Hi, Vicki. Okay. It's Libby. Hi, Libby. Hi. You guys are all amazing. And I second what everybody said. Um, I love this program and being a pseudo mindful mentor wannabe. <laughs> I mean, a real wannabe, a pseudo I'm mindful mentor. Um, I, uh, I keep thinking it would be awesome to have something in the clinic, kind of like a channel for the inpatient units. But if in the clinic, say the screensaver could actually be a movie with some mindfulness techniques. So when the nurse finishes the check-in and then the patients are waiting for the, sorry, dog, waiting for the doctor to come in, there could be a little mindfulness thing going on or some relaxing music or some tips on the screen for what they could do, right? Something to entertain them, but also kind of captive audience to be watching something. Oh, what a fabulous idea. And that sounds like something that could really be done. I mean, that sounds pretty doable. We should do I mean, that before we take the blood pressure readings. Yeah, yes. <laughs> before and then yep. after. Oh my gosh, what a great idea. We'll have to figure out who to talk to about that. That is a super duper idea. Yeah. Yes. And then it, it's something where the computer's still locked, but it was just playing for them. Yeah. Oh my gosh, fantastic idea. I wrote it down. Thank you. Love that. And that could happen in any clinic throughout the hospital once, once we get it figured out. Awesome. Thank you. What other ideas are out there? This is wonderful. Hmm. Anybody else have any ideas? Thank you all for staying. I know we've run over time. Vicki for president. Ha. Huh. Oh, okay. <laughs> Vicky, Vicky, Vicky. Uh, thank you all so much. You're doing amazing, amazing, amazing work. Thank you for everybody who joined us today. Um, you know how to find us if you have any other ideas that aren't popping in your mind right now um, that you want to share or anything that, with this that you want to get involved in. Um, so greatly appreciate all of you. And thank you. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you all. Thanks, Vicki. Thank you. Mm -hmm.